Most ex-vegans like Tim Sheaf and Rowena somehow tell us that eating fish again made them feel better. But does this truly make sense? The, the first night after I had that salmon, I had a wet dream. I hadn't ejaculated in months. Arguably, fishes are distinctly different from our own organism. They can't speak, they don't have hair nor fur, they can't hit the like and subscribe button under a quality gains video, which probably means they're suffering from extreme FOMO, and they also have a different breeding mechanism, which makes them able to extract oxygen underwater. Because we feel the most empathy for people and species that look similar to us, it is hard to come to grips that fish may have similar desires than we do. But do they actually? Here's a glimpse of three questions I will answer in this video. And the three answers probably will shock you. Or not. I mean, this is a YouTube channel about veganism. <laughs> okay, let's hit it. One of the evolutionary adaptations that arguably had a very big effect on the survival of a certain species was the development of a brain. A brain allows us to immediately react to our surroundings with the help of the attached nervous system that spans to almost all areas of our bodies. But apparently not the edge of the elbow. That's why people can lick your elbow and you wouldn't really notice. You felt that? That non-existent sensation in your left arm was probably some ninja licking your elbow. <laughs> anyway, we have nervous systems and brains to help us survive from an evolutionary point of view. The nervous system, if you think about it, is an immediate feedback mechanism extremely important in our survival. If you touch a hot stove, it takes a millisecond to take our hand away from it. In my opinion, that's fascinating. Because nerves are giving us feedbacks, it is essentially a driving force of most of our behavior. Eating calorie-dense foods, for example, makes us feel good because it enhanced the survival possibility of our ancestors in the past. Getting rejected feels bad because it decreased the survival possibility of our ancestors. Rejections and eating high-calorie foods in themselves are emotionless things. It's our nervous system coupled with some hormones that create the sensation of pleasure or pain. Number one, do fish feel pain? The answer to that question is quite logical and simple. A nervous system, including the brain, is an immediate feedback mechanism for an organism. And if there are two types of stimulus, one that quote-unquote feels good for us and one that quote-unquote feels bad for us, and pain is an unpleasant sensation that can range from mild, localized discomfort to agony and is created by our nervous system, the question is not, do fish feel pain, but do fish have brains? And indeed, they do. If we all agree that the evolutionary purpose of the brain is being a feedback mechanism, then a brain doesn't matter how small, will still create a sort of the sensation of pain. Now do fish have the same exact sensation of pain than we do? We don't know, but it needs to be uncomfortable to some degree because it changes future behavior. Therefore we can conclude that fish do feel pain, because we can see that one of the earliest adaptations of a brain was to create pain and pleasure. Why? I thought you would never ask, my man. <laughs> because if we define various tasks of the brain and give them a ranking on the importance of survival, I would probably give them the following ranking. Sensation of pain and pleasure is probably a 1. Socializing and the group ties are probably a 2. And only then comes creating hypothetical scenarios in the brain, such as dreaming or worrying, which I give the ranking factor 3. Pain and pleasure are the fundament for number two and number three. Because what truly makes thinking about hypothetical scenarios, dreaming or social interactions beneficial is the avoidance of pain and the seeking of pleasure. If slamming your toe on the edge of the table would make you feel like an orgasm, do you think there is something that will prevent you from doing that? Look at this scene where this guy apparently rammed a knife in his body because it made him feel good. Stab myself, cut myself. You can see me rib, you can see me rib when I take that off. Pain, if it works properly, not as we've seen in this guy, is the feedback mechanism of our body and the sole fundament of movement. We can logically conclude that yes, fish feel pain, and yes, fish suffer. Doesn't matter how small or primitive their brain might be. Because even the function of the most primitive of brains is probably the guidance of movement by the sensation of pleasure and pain. So let's see how we currently treat these sentient beings. Number two, is fish farming humane? 
there's no sense in asking if the farming of soybeans for example is humane if soybeans don't have a nervous system nor a brain. Fishes have brains, so it's in our moral and ethical interest to look at the current farming practices. To this day, more than 23,000 factory ships weighing more than 100 tons steer around the oceans of this planet. And if I would need to describe fishing by ships in two words, it's collateral damage. The definition of collateral damage is the infliction of an injury to something other than an intended target. Why? Because two of the most common fish farming methods are trawling and longlining. In trawling, you essentially draw a large open mounted net along the ocean that catches everything and suffocates everything in its path. Longlining is drawing hooks to trail for 50 miles or more behind the ship, trapping the fish and pulling them for miles on end through their misery. Needless to say, threatened animals like sea turtles, dolphins and even seabirds more often than not die in a net or on a line. According to the estimates of professionals, at least 40% of total worldwide intended catch is bycatch. 40%. These are 200 million pounds of quote unquote unintended dead animals a day. About 800,000 pounds since the beginning of this video. There are some fishing methods that have a bycatch rate of 10 to 1. For every pound of shrimp that gets caught in the Gulf of Mexico, for example, 10 pounds of other animals needlessly die. These are all sentient beings that get killed and then just get thrown back in the sea. This waste of life is just extremely depressing. Contrary to our belief, these endeavors don't get taxed or pursued. Instead, the US government pays out 2.3 billion to the fishing industry each year in subsidies. Japan and China pay out each nearly 5 billion a year in subsidies. As outputs from wild ocean fisheries drop, fish farming or aquaculture is on the rise. In 2012, more than half the American fish they consumed came from fish farms. But those fish farms, contrary to some beliefs, are not the way of the future. There are three problems of fish farms. Number one is a lack of space. Essentially, fish farms are the factory farms of the sea. What matters is cost reduction and efficiency, not necessarily health and ethics. The fish get stapled so close that usually 27 are found in a normal bathtub size. Problems of such tight enclosing is the development of parasites such as the sea lice. This is especially a problem in salmon farms. One solution is to kill off the parasites with concentrated chemicals, which works but countless of animals around the fish farms die by the use of it. Funny that people worry about pesticides when the fishes that they eat are literally living in poison. The second issue of animal farms in general is the huge waste products they produce. The waste ends up going down to the seabed and killing the underlying animals. There's so much waste produced that the fish farming alone of Scotland created almost double the phosphorus than the human population of 5 million of the country. The third issue is a bad conversion rate of fish production. Contrary to normal factory farm animals, most fishes that we eat are not herbivores they're carnivores. They're the swirches of the ocean. Fishes like tuna or salmon need up to 5 pounds of feet, again other fish, to put on 1 pound of their own flesh. Consequently, millions of pounds of prey fish such as sardines and krill are caught each year to feed the fish that actually get eaten by us. The rest of the prey fish, by the way, is fed to farm animals. Eating animals that are higher in the food chain is a significant issue not only for ocean life but also for our health. Number 3. Is eating fish healthy? Fish is considered to be healthy because of the omega trees that they provide. These fatty acids are important for our brain health and essentially prevent brain shrinkage after we've reached a certain age. But we need to ask ourselves if the benefits of omega trees are worth the risk of fish consumption. While omega-3 is beneficial for our health, we need to take a look at the whole package. If I would drop an apple in a petrol container, I think we wouldn't eat it even if the apple industry would be claiming that it contained antioxidants. Just because there's one good aspect in a food doesn't make it consume worthy. Most of the fish that we're eating are animals that are higher in the food chain. And if animals are higher in the food chain, there's also a higher chance that they contain heavy metals and toxins that can harm our 
health. One such metal that is of concern is mercury. In past times, there were routine chill vaccinations that contained traces of mercury. I say past times because they're not allowed anymore. Yet ironically, one can of tuna contains the same amount as 200 shots of those previous vaccines. And fishes don't produce fatty acids from nothing. They produce omega-3s from the algae that they eat. Why don't we just do the same thing? Why don't we stop eating the apple with the petrol and just go for the apple? Conclusion, fish consumption creates a variety of different problems, ranging from the systemized destruction of sentient beings to significant health problems with the regular heavy metal exposure of animals higher in the food chain. It is not safe, nor moral, nor frankly sane for health authorities to recommend the consumption of fish, if there are much better alternatives available. The saying the whole is better than the sum of its parts is not essentially true, because sometimes all we need is just one part of the entirety. The mission of this YouTube channel is to put veganism across the goal line. If you want to help us achieve that, like and subscribe to this channel and don't forget to hit the bell icon. Let's make food production great again.